갈아요. 카스런. 음. Here goes for a second time. Me talking about my film. Here it is. Incoming under the radar. In January, which is only a few weeks ahead. Okay, you've asked me a couple of questions. Intriguing questions. So here goes. Here's the question. Okay. I have to wear my glasses. I hope you're well. We are back in rehearsal for our piece based on your film. And I've been thinking a lot about the role of Alberta Tiburzi. Why did you originally cast her? What did you want from the love story? Can I quote that again? What did you want from the love story? Because that's clearly what this question is about. And why does she disappear? So, of course, anyone like a romantic young lady or someone who sees it as a love story must well indeed be rather upset when suddenly she seems to disappear. At least she walks out. Or she was sent out. Maybe we'll come to that in a moment. For an hour's time. Um, but mostly what she signifies for you within the film. Signifies for you within the film. Why you chose to structure her involvement in the film in the way you did once you got to editing the material. And this is implying that it was in the editing process only that I managed to involve her in the film. I may be misreading that but it's certainly not true editing the material. If you have any thoughts on this that you'd be willing to share, I'd really appreciate it. Off to rehearsal now. Happy to be working again on your film. And I can assure you, Catherine, I'm delighted that you are working on it again. It was wonderful news that it was to go on after its initial showings in New York and to an even better showing, I think. Well, to answer your question, you know, it's rather an important question, to be honest. Much more important, probably, than you realise. So here's the answer. Look, just a few words. Just a few words, actually. Well, here we are. This is the first lot. OK. I think there's 225 pages on this one. This is my diary that I wrote in New York while I was making the film. Every single thing about the film, including my relationship to Alberta and to New York, is in this. I don't know which one, I think that's book three. <laughs> book three? Yeah. Here's book two. I seem to have lost book one. Now this is book one. Ah, look. Hold on, you can't see all this happening. Right, here we are. Book, book one. The Diaries of Peter Whitehead. A record at the Fall Dossier. Everything, everything. Well, why you write a diary, and I've always written diaries all my life, I've discovered now, at my tender age of 78, almost 79, is it enables you to forget things. You can shelve them and you can think, oh, I don't have to remember that. It's in my diary, for God's sake. But of course, diaries just get put on the shelf and get a lot of dust and they end up in an archive like I have. But these, look, wow, there's a load more here, look. These are the important bits I've selected for you for this simple question. Maybe my film and its diaries are rather important. Maybe one day someone wants to discover how the film happened and how it happened to be so-called, perhaps, love story. It requires a very pretty, very beautiful young woman to see my film and my story with Alberta as a love story. But, by golly, it was a love story. I didn't talk to Alberta for 40 years. Only recently. She got in touch with me from Italy 
she had found me on the internet. She said she was looking for me because she was interested in the past, as we all are at a certain point in our lives. She found me, she looked me up on Google, she found that the, our film was mentioned and I'd made all these other films and I'd written books and about God. So she was very intrigued, wrote and said, well, wonderful how happy I am. Gosh, how lovely to have found you. And we phoned a few times and talked about things and I said I'd love to meet her. She said she'd love to meet me and we kind of arranged it, but I got very ill then for almost a year. Um, but I said, listen, Albert, this is very important. You come just at the right moment because I'm doing a book. I like doing books. And my books are normally screenplays. I've lost the latest one. Anyway, I told her that I was doing... Finally, the screenplay, it was nearly finished. There'd been so much interest in the fall academically as much as it being shown. And, of course, there was the thing now with Sister Sylvester and Catherine that I was now publishing the book of the screenplay and it was near, the actual description of the, of the film was done. It's just a question now of doing the additional bits and pieces which I call the dossier. Um, two or three essays, very important essays, some reviews and so on. And I said to her that, um, would it matter if I... Um, you know, said personal things about her. Because um, in my diary, which I intended to have certain excerpts, it had already been published in a, an academic journal in America called Framework. Um, and I said, would you mind if I have some excerpts from my diary about us? Because I think that um, your relationship to me and me to you in the making of this film is an essential part of the film and I think it's actually been rather missed. Obviously the emphasis being 90% on the documentary film and the uh, Columbia and um, the fact is it's a documentary film about the collapse of protest in 1968 in New York City. Why on earth should, be it about, should it be about a love story between Peter White and Alberta Tavozzi? And she said, well, of course, I'd be absolutely thrilled if you wanted to do it. I said, well, you know, uh, mm, okay, well, I can do it. She said, but listen, <laughs> I have something to tell you. A bit embarrassing. And I said, well, go on. She said, I never told you at the time. Of course I didn't. How could I possibly tell you? But you were writing a diary every day, or at least every night, normally till five in the morning, throughout our relationship and um, through all the filming and the working on the books and all the things we did for a couple of years. And I said, oh, right, yes. She said, well, I was writing a diary as well at the same time, in parallel, that you knew nothing about. I said, no, true, I didn't know you were writing a diary. She said, well, I didn't want to tell you, obviously, because I'd have <laughs> lost the contract, I would have lost the connection. And I said, well, well, that's very, very naughty of you. And she said, well, you know, you wanted a femme fatale as a girlfriend, you got one. And I said, well, these diaries, she said, I have them all. I've been looking at them recently because I've been sort of organising a kind of private archive now. She became a very important, very, one of the most important photographers in Rome, fashion photographers and otherwise, for 30 years. And she said, I was in fact just planning also to do a sort of a book. And I was looking through all my things and I found my diaries and read some of them. And she said, I was so moved, upset, miserable, angry, God knows what else, what one does when one reads diaries of X number of years. But of course, going through her diaries now, or then, I don't know what time scale we're in now, there were quotations from my diaries. And of course, in my diaries, <laughs> my little diaries, 200, five, I think it's 750 pages, <clears throat> typed. Um, it was the whole story, really, as far as I was concerned, about my making of the film. If I was making a film in New York, it was interesting, and I was living at the time with a very interesting, very cooperative, very, very... A perfect accomplishment. I would write about it from every point of view, and I had done. 
And Alberta said that, you know, unfortunately, one of the reasons I think why we parted in the end was because I had been reading your notebooks, which is probably quite true. She said, you never said that you didn't love me, and I knew you did, but you always said you were always lonely. And she said, I thought and I knew I could never not make you lonely. You were just so busy doing this and doing that with your films and everything. Anyway, I said, well, this, can, this we could have a very nice sequence in my screenplay of the diaries of Alberto Tibozzi and Peter White going through, documenting some of the times we filmed together and the, some of the arguments we had. And I've been reading them now, my da and I dare not think how much, how I dared to forget the contribution that Alberta played at all points after she came into my life. I'll just um, read the first page I got back from her when we agreed. <laughs> we agreed that I could use some of her diary excerpts. She sent me a massive, beautiful photocopy book of all her diaries. So I have all her diaries too. This was page one. A kind of letter. Number one, Diary 1968, The Fall, from Alberta to Peter. Please forgive my English. I hope you will be able to understand. At the end, in translating, I left out only a few pages, mostly the ones regarding my childhood. So it was quite a job. But it has been for me an intense experience, a clear analyse of our difficult, beautiful story. It is easy to see from this diary, which is about what Albertina was. That's the name that she always had for me, not Alberta, but Albertina, was really feeling at the time why we had to separate. You always use the words dark, darkness, dark side, night, night wood. I always use the words light, the sun, sun rays, sun shadows, the sea, the desert. Later here in Rome, as a photographer, they called me the Lady of Light. So I had to fly away. Brackets to the sun, question mark. Was I afraid of being swollen by the black hole like a neutron star? As I told you, I am submerging you with words and images. I wrote notes on the back of some photographs. In this beautiful folder she sent me of the entire diaries were lots of beautiful photographs. That's the first one I got. Here's the sec the last one, which I'm not going to give you that yet. Has some serious talk. Much more serious talk, Catherine, than you realise. When I came to answer your question thinking about it, thinking, how, how would I start? Just, you know, she slipped into my life in quite a crazy way, but how, etc. I discovered mm, what I had forgotten, not about her necessarily, but completely forgotten about the early, I thought I had my sunglasses on, um, the early making of the fall. So I'm sorry, I had to start from the beginning. But I think you'll find if I'm talking about Alberta in the beginning of the film, because she came into my life round about the beginning, it's an important answer to your question. How could it not be if I was starting one of the great, greatest love affair of my life at the moment in New York, trying to make a film, the ultimate film about the protests and goodness knows what else, and assassination in the film in New York. But that, mind you, what I'm saying now is a complete lie, because when I first met her, I hadn't actually formulated any particular idea about the film I was going to make. Right, we're going off on a bit of a tangent. 
but it's very important to the story. Except I've lost it. Oh no. Yeah. I want to show you a book. Here's a book. It's a novel I wrote. It's actually called Tonight Let's All Make Love in London. And it's got a picture of a very beautiful girl on the front. Lily Moore Stromberg, very famous international Swedish model, who at the time come to London, swinging London. I was making films, we got together, we lived together for a bit. I made a lot, several films with her. She was very intelligent. She, she became a very, very successful, serious political journalist. Years and years later, I discovered. At that time, she was a wild 60s creature with a burning intelligence who'd lend, who led me quite a song and dance. This novel is the complete story of my making two films. Holy Communion, and tonight let's all make love in London, interwoven with my love story, with Lillimore. Well, I took two of my films, tonight let's all make love in London, and Benefit of the Doubt, both of which are going to become characters in this monologue, to New York at the invitation of Richard Rudd for the New York Film Festival. This is how the fall began. So I arrived there with the two films and they were shown at a press conference. At the press conference I was approached by two very smart, young uh, American girls from New York who said they loved my films and would I be interested in making a film in New York about the city and the people and the protest and the art and everything like I had done in my film tonight that's all make love in London. And I said, well, you want um, tonight that's all make love in New York? They sort of smiled, I saw them, hmm. you know, looking as if to say, gosh, that'd be fun. And I said, well, I'm terribly sorry, but I do not see New York. I'd visited several times in the previous years. I do not see New York as being somewhere, somewhere where I could make a film called Tonight and Tommy Lovin. You know, she said, you must make a film. Do you feel that you could come here and, like you do, shoot this and that and the other and tie it all up in, you know, a movie? Uh, we'd be very happy to finance it because we raise money from different people and everything. It won't be too difficult. We can meet and talk how much you want and all that. Well, within three days, we sorted the whole thing out. You were absolutely charming. And they said, oh, do you? We can rent a, we rent a, a sort of hotel suite, <laughs> sort of flat. Big, ho big old hotels were sort of divided into flat. You can live there and we, you know, we can form a company if you like and you can make a film. I think we formed a company called Scene in New York, S-C-E-N-E. -E. And um, I said, well, oh, that's fantastic. I must go back to England, get my camera and come back. And <laughs> he said, if I will, we'll, we'll put the money in the account and we'll look forward to seeing you. <laughs> what about my family? We pay your expenses to come from England to here, blah, blah, blah. I said, okay, well, I'll be back quite soon because um, there's about a two-week gap between the press conference and the, the big night when both my films, two films, imagine, two 60-minute films being shown in the film festival. So off I went to London to get my camera, my gear, sort a few things out with children and ex-wives and things, and grabbed my girlfriend, and flew to New York and moved into the hotel suite provided by my new producers, sitting down and thinking, well, how exciting. Because I loved American movies, I loved them. You know, I mean, it was a fascinating challenge. And I knew just how dark it was. I just made a film, Benefit of the Doubt, 60-minute film about, you know, England and America at war with Vietnam, based on a play in the Royal Shakespeare. Company. Tonight it's all make love in London, the book and the film starts off T-O-N-I-T-E, not tonight spelled the English way, because that film, which was the great success of the film festival, and my life I might say, um, was based on the, the perception of so-called swinging London by Americans. My theory was that they'd um, invented the whole thing and put it on Time magazine to sort of reduce the power, which they were beginning to worry about, of the protest movement in England. I actually filmed with Bertrand Russell 
made an hour-long film, which was hijacked by some Americans, but about the war in Vietnam and England's responsibility towards it. So, I arrive in New York this time around, and the two films are going to be shown in the Lincoln Center. All kinds of very important people were coming, sold out. I was sitting in the box with Lily Moore Stromberg, looking a million dollars. Well, she was my bank manager, but she wasn't. And um, it was a oh, standing ovation at the end. It came out, you know, staggering out and feeling, well, this is it. Here it is. I've got to make a film. Goodness, well, thank you very much, everybody. And grabbed uh, Lily Moore back to the hotel and sat down and sorted my camera out. Because we were working very quick, short or deadlines. And um, off I went the next day to film a few things. I think Lily Moore had a couple of um, shows that she wanted to be involved in, and agents she wanted to see, and photographers. So for the next week, I think or so, um, she was doing that and planning this and planning that, and I was rushing off to film strange things and goodness knows what else. And I eventually, during this time, discovered there was something quite alarming, having read what it was about. There was a play being put on in Greenwich Village called Hair, H-I-H-A-I-R. I'm dyslexic nowadays from goodness knows what disease. Hair. I was devastated. I thought it was so brilliant. It was a kind of a musical, but was it a musical? It was a it was almost a it was a political statement about the you know, what the hippies meant, what the counterculture meant, what their dreams were, how they were being frustrated, and it was a kind of a musical. It was just so beautiful lovely, human, entertaining. And there in the front of it was this young girl. What was her name? I can't remember. <laughs> can't remember. But she is crucial to this story. Crucial. She was the lead actress. Because at the beginning, in the middle of it, somehow or another, we had all these documentary bits, you know? what was happening in Vietnam, what was happening with the blacks and all this kind of stuff. But in the middle of it, you know, this was a kind of love story. Can I quote you, Catherine? A love story. Had to be a love story to sort of come back. It's a musical, you know. But it was a politicized, it was a political play. It was trying to do both. Entertain, be fun, pretty, nice, lovely good little girl, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it was a, you know, it's a reasonable success. It got a few reviews, not terribly good reviews, actually. I thought it was brilliant, but here was the problem. I had already started shooting some bits and pieces of the same old documentary stuff that I was getting so fed up with. And if you want, Catherine, a warning, if you want the whole story about my disillusionment with documentary films, it's all in my diaries much worse than my disillusionment with the female of the species, which I was never truly disillusioned. I got in touch with the guy who was the director of Hair. And I said, I was an English guy, I'd had these films shown at the film festival, blah, blah. And he said, I think I heard about that, and one about Vietnam. That's right, yes. And I said, well, listen, I'd seen his play. I absolutely thought it was brilliant, and I'd like to shoot a little bit of it. Could I film 15 minutes, maybe, and, and use it in my new film? I got finance in New York, and I'm now making a film about New York. And he said, well, I will be very honoured, yes, you both your films in the New York Film Festival, blah, blah. I said, yes, I'd love to do it. And he said, well, I'll have a word with my directors and various people, and if you can ring me in a few days. And I'll so I ring him in a few days, and he says, well... Because I'd said I'd like to film about 15. He said, well, it's sort of good news and bad news. I don't know quite, you know. He said, um, you, unfortunately, you can't film 15 minutes. And I said, right, well, okay, okay. You know, I'll film 10 minutes. Five minutes. It's so wonderful. And whatever her name was, O'Hara. Gorgeous and fascinating. And I thought it was so, etc. And he said, yeah, well, no, 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 that's not the problem. He said, it's not a question of you filming too much. He said, it's, you're filming too little. And I said, how do you mean? She said, well, you can't film 15 minutes. And I said, yes. And he said, well, you have to film the whole thing. I said, well, why? He said, well, you know, it's the 
it's the union. We're all actors and we're part of the union. And the union will not allow you just to film a small part of it because we're a commune. I said, OK. Well, so, I'd ha so you'll have to film the whole thing. I said, but it's over an hour long. Said, yes, or whatever minutes it was. And I said, oh, well, I said, I think it's going to be a bit too, ex <laughs> too expensive one way or another. And he said, well, I thought you might say that, yeah, but I'm sorry, you know, it's got to be an hour or nothing. It's a bit longer than an hour. I said, well, OK, but have you, how, how much would it cost me then to film the whole thing? So we didn't have to film the whole thing. You know, all the actors and actors will come and sit in the audience while you're filming whatever it is you want to film on the stage. And anyone you're not filming will have to be there as part of it. And you have to pay them as well. You have to pay everybody the same same thing. Everybody. The identical same amount of money. I said, well, how much is it going to be? He said, $25,000. Oh, I said, well, that, hold on. <laughs> I'd only got $25,000 to make my whole film in New York. And I said, well... I'd love to do it. I'll try. Good heavens. I said, I can probably do something with the whole thing, couldn't I? Could I take it to England? He said, yeah, you would, if you make a film of it, you own the film, you're, we'd sign it over to you for this particular production. And yeah, I mean, you know, good luck. We'd love the, we'd love the publicity. <laughs> so I ring up my friends and they say, they go, one, one guy goes down there to look at one of the money men, friends of the two girls. Comes back and says, well, it's a bit kitsch, and it's a bit romantic, and it's a bit soppy, and it's a bit, I don't know, it's, it's sort of hippies, and, you know, kind of hair, you know, cutting. Look at this, you see, I'm still influenced by the bloody play. Look at my hair. So they say, no. I said, well, 25, you know, I said, if I raise the money somehow, they said, well, yeah, you can do if you like, but, you know, we don't like the idea much, and we don't like the play, and we don't want you to get involved with other people. You're music people. And I said, OK, well, that's fine. Well, if I bought that evening to film the whole thing for $25,000, of course, I would have eventually made $3 million because it was only six months later that it went to Broadway and it was only a year later that it was sold to Hollywood for, I don't know, $30, $30 million, or however much it was, one of the most expensive films of its time, and it grossed, I don't know, $2 billion and this. OK, I missed a fantastic opportunity. If I'd been a rich man, I'd have been an even richer man. I didn't. I lost hair and I lost the girl because having seen the play, having decided to do the 15 minutes, I was really cheating because I wanted to do the 15 minutes with her and then to persuade her to be in my film because I decided that I did not want to make an ordinary, boring old documentary film. I wanted it like hair, to have some warmth, some, you know, something, let's just say warmth. Some yin, rather than all the, the yang and the violence and all that. I'd lost her, yeah. But she had been extremely influenced, influential. I wanted her because I had now decided to take up the idea and it's all in my diaries. Of doing the fall from a totally different point of view. I write novels, got a load of them here, won't show you. And I thought what I'm gonna do actually is write a story. I'm gonna write a novel. I can write a novel in 25 days. I'm gonna write a novel about a boy and a girl, boy meets girl. Same as in hair. I should use Jill O'Hara, I think her name was, as well. All I've got to do is find an actor, and she'll know an actor. I will write a whole story and a whole script and everything, and then um, that'll be the film. It won't be documentary-based entirely, at all, in fact. It will be largely a fictional story with the documentary added, not the other way around. Now, um, I then decided, yes, I was going to write a novel slash screenplay. Um, well, that's as far as I'd got with the film. It was falling apart, actually. 
Lenny Moore disappeared after a few arguments because she discovered that I wasn't going to use her in the film. Ideally, I was going to use the girl from Hair. You know, that show business. So, Lily Moore departed, but she was such a gorgeous, wonderful, crazy girl that, you know, I couldn't sort of carry her through a serious film anyway. I was very sad. She went. A few days later, I get a phone call. A strange phone call. I'll read out at some point from my diary the time when Alberta came into my life. It's very touching. I don't know whether I can find it easily, Alberta. No, I don't think I can. Um, later, I might add that on at the end for Catherine alone. I write in my diary that I get a strange phone call and a voice at the end I didn't recognize, a girl's voice, Italian, who introduces herself. You do not know me. I can't do Italian accent. I can do American ones. Um, you don't know me. My name is Alberta, Alberta Tibozzi. I said, yeah. And she said, I'm a very close friend to um, Lily Moore. I've known Lily Moore for several years. We've done shoots together and this. I know all about you and Lily Moore. <clears throat> you were here in New York and she worked with you in London and everything. Because we met just recently. I, I hear she's gone back to England. And I felt like saying, yeah, well, but I said, yes. Very sad. And I was actually being a bit unfair. And Alberta said, well, you're now going to make a new film? I said, yes, I'm going to make a new film. In New York? Yeah. You, you had these films, one's called Tonight, this will make love in London. <laughs> what a lovely title. Yes. They said, well, I'd love to meet you. I'm a fashion model. I've worked with um, Lily Moore quite often, and I'm here in, I live in New York now. I said, right. She said, you will know from my accent that I am from Rome. And I said, yes. I said, well, she said, I'd love to meet you and, you know, see if I can help at all with, you know, maybe you want to meet people or I know lots of very important people here in New York. And she did. She was one of the top half dozen fashion models in the world, certainly in New York. And I said, OK, well, I'd ring her in a few days. Well, I didn't ring her. I didn't ring her, not for about a month, by which time, because I got caught up with filming an awful lot of other things. I'm battling with the big problem, which is how to convert my film backwards into a fictional story, which I was writing all the time. Again about the assassination, the protest assassination, the murder of an innocent person, and in this case, someone who's dying in a hospital. My young couple, there has to be a couple, there have to be the lovers. There has to be the Romeo and Juliet. There has to be, I don't know, go through them quite a lot. In my case, it's probably um, Kathy and Heathcliff. But um, it has to be, has to have, boy meets girl. As Sigmund Freud said, to understand the whole history of British culture, art, religion, you only need three words. The... I won't give them all now. Why not? The family romance. As she said, if you want to understand simple madness or collective madness or historical madness or whatever, it all boils down to that and to the central word. Family. But it's now in, in French and, or whatever it is, familiar. Well, we know what familiars mean. You know, American Indians know what familiars mean. I'm sure mine would be a wolf, except I now know it's a falcon. But we're talking about actually another meaning of the word family for Freud. It means the uncanny. The crucible of the uncanny is the family. And when we see it working at large, in its destructive ways. We tend to be in the cinema or the theatre, but we're shown there. Okay, that, those three words, that idea of the family being the source of the possession and the haunting that controls everything we've ever done.
from Sophocles to Shakespeare to Edward Albee to Schoen, uh, the lot. So there has to be, I had by this time decided, rightly or wrongly, that even in my particular new film, there had to be a boy meets girl. Hopefully the boy was going to be me meeting Miss O'Hara and persuading her to abandon her play and come and make my film. Fortunately, it never happened. At the time, though, in England, just prior to this, and one thing or another, I was publishing books. Alpha Will, the screenplay, Jean Le Gara, Le Petit Soldat, Jean Le Gunner, Pierre Le Fou, Jean Le Gunner, The Seventh Seal, Ingmar Bergman, Made in USA, Jean Le Gunner, Here's the two night it's all make love in London novel. Right. Oedipus Rex. Oedipus Rex. Pasolini. I've published all these. I wrote the screenplay, the descriptions of the films. But, pick the most important one. Where's Weekend? Okay. Goddard. Let's take Made in USA. This is a book I published. Here's the screenplay. Load of pictures. Lorimer Publishing. Here is my. Yeah. Here, look. <laughs> Hold on a minute. Let's take out the Pierre Le Fou. Ah, Anna Karina. Le Petit Soldat. Ah, <laughs> Anna Karina. Alphaville. <laughs> God, look at that image. Ah. What a beautiful image. Anna Karina. Anna, Anna Karina, in my film, in my script, in my novel that I later wrote, I called Alberta Anna, why not? How could I call her anything else? What am I going to call her? Juliana Anna. Made in USA. Why I'm saying all of this is because who's got out of said it? Got a thing somewhere else we've got out of it. Goddard said, to make a successful film, you only need a beautiful girl and a gun. I was going to make a fine, I had the beautiful girl, the gun I could give somebody $75 and buy one. All I had to find was him. And that was easy because she would have her, one of her actors, Bob's your uncle, Robert Lloyd, I think his name was, Bob's your um, I had to simply finish the script. Well, I lost the script. I discovered it thanks to you, Catherine. Going through my old... Here we are. I had by this time decided to call it The Fall. The Fall. Treatment for full-length documentary slash feature film by Peter Whitehead. On the top, first synthesis of documentary film plus personal story. Personal story, boy meets girl, the family, romance. What you need, baby, is romance. The time has come in America when the normal language of protest, etc. Oh, how many pages is this? I say 60, eh? Anyway. One day, sometime later, not too far off, I would go to Paris with Alberta to write this out as a proper screenplay. And I raised the money in London to make it as a film, based on it being a fiction feature film with a bunch of sort of interesting and fun documentary stuff surrounding it. That's what I ended up in America with. Alberta on my arm, coming back from Paris, we left into London, we raised the rest of the money to make a fiction film with documentary attachments. And she, oh no, she didn't want to be an actress. The last thing in the world she went. She said, Peter, I can't act, I'm not an actress. I, I, I don't mind being a director. <laughs> 
I kind of laugh and think, yeah, I joke, but I mean, unfortunately, it was true. She did not want to act. She didn't want to act. She said, I cannot act. She was right. She couldn't act. Didn't matter. As it happened, as time went by. Well, it's very interesting because two things I discovered quite soon afterwards, which were now in relationship, 100% in relationship to your question and to my predicament throughout making the film. There's a film called Medium Cool, which I'm sure you know, Wexler's film, extraordinary film, magnificent in many ways. All this harrowing film footage, documentary footage in Chicago, Mayor Daly, Chicago, and all his brutal police destroying the revolution, trying to. Now's the revolution. Now's the revolution in my film. Several people always used to tell me, oh, your film is very like his. His films were a bit like yours and all this kind of stuff and everything. And I can remember at some point, I think one point, in saying, yeah, and of course there's the boy and the girl going through it. Anyway, I looked at it recently because I hadn't, I hadn't remembered the details. I'd always remembered that I'd seen the film. This was obviously years later because it came out three or four years, I think, after I made the four. I remember being very irritated by the boy meets girl story. All this extraordinary war. But I mean, in a way, he didn't have any choice. He had to get the film shown. He had all this magnificent documentary stuff. How is he going to carry it? How is he going to get the money? How is he going to get it onto CNN? It didn't exist in those days, which, or sell it to Hollywood. Ah, brilliant. He would write a love story, The Boy and the Girl. The boy is a journalist, filmmaker, journalist, and he's disappeared in the middle of the war. And she's looking for him, and we see her going everywhere in her yellow dress. It's so moving, it's so warm, it's so harrowing, it's so romantic, you know. At this rate, it's going to be on the front of Vogue, let alone MGM. So all the way through the film, we have the story. Well, okay, <laughs> I admire him, I admire him the way he did it. It's technically brilliant. And she, they weren't bad, but I mean, there were lots of, well, now when I see it, I think, you know, thank God I didn't watch it because it would have sort of pushed me in some of the directions maybe that I might not have wanted to go. But I was dealing with issues that he talks about quite openly and I talk about quite openly in my film. The question of the filmmaker the nature of the film, the classic line in the middle of the film. Watch out, Wexler, this is real. Where is the veil between the real and the unreal, the documentary and the love story and the ghosts, the Heimliche, the romance. Romance is the word. Romance comes from roman, the French for novel. I went to Paris after meeting Alberta, doing a bit of filming with her, moving in with her in a very nice flat in overlooking the park, and I, I was in love with her. And I believe she was in love with me. And she was didn't want to act, but she would do everything she could to help. And by God, she did. This book here, one of the most important books I ever did have got out. Pierre Le Fou. We did I did all this when we were together. But she helped me because I had to write a screenplay, which is what this is, by translating it from the French. So while we were making the film in the beginning, our initial ideas it was about Pierre Le Fou. A love story, funny enough, between Goddard himself, thinly disguised, and Anna Karina, thinly dressed. Our film I was obsessed by. An alpha bill that I had done after meeting Goddard. So I went to Paris with Alberta and wrote a script. As I said, went to London, got the money, arrived in New York now to make a film about the agreement that I had with the Americans that it would nevertheless be a Peter Whited film continuing from the other ones 
and that I, whatever I did with it was up to me, and then they'd met Alberta, and etc. I went off with a couple of Alberta's, I don't mind, you know, coming along to a protest march and everything, but don't ask me to act and do all that. He said, it's not me, you know, I'm fed up. Anyway, with being seen, being photographed. The last thing in the world I want is now to be an actress. She was actually living with one of the most famous actresses in Italy at the time, can't remember her name. When I moved in with her, she was still living with this girl. She's in my film. She was in um, Death in Venice. Anyway, she knew all about acting. She, may, she might have tried it, I don't know. I agreed that I didn't necessarily therefore want to use her if I was going to have a couple somewhere embedded in my film. I told her that I wanted it to be about young, younger people um, hippies, if you like, because that was the rage and that was the films I'd made and the novels, etc. But, you know, radicalised, moving from legitimate protest towards violence. Exactly the issues that are mentioned in Medium Cool and discussed in an identical way to I was, the way I was doing it. Because that was the problem. That was the problem. Alberta and I were living together and we were doing these scripts, actually. It was actually in the flat where she was helping me. I was writing this script for this young couple who were going to murder somebody who was dying in a hospital because the girl was a nurse and he had a week to live. So, okay, kill him. Make a big assassination story in the newspapers. That's what we wanted. That's what I wanted in my the fall. You were killed. You were shot. In a protest movie. Film. The world, the eyes and ears of the world would be on you. Well, here's a great story. Young, a guy dying of cancer is assassinated in a hospital. Then there's a left, someone's left a note. You know, down with man and daily or whatever. It all seemed to make sense. There would be the assassination in the beginning of the story. Le Petit Soldat, <laughs> an assassination. You know, I won't go through all these films, books of mine. They break my heart. Right, so Alberta and I are now working together, and I can't, haven't got time to read them now. But here, and here, and here, Catherine, are a lot of accounts where a lot of the contribution to what we were doing was done, brought to fruition, thanks to Alberta. Now, Alberta had two other extraordinarily dynamic, if I may use that word, influences on me. From the day I met her, well, here we are, look, here it is. And we went for a walk in New York to do some filming. Here it is, look, on my monitor here, look, there you go. Alberta! Can you see it? Yes, just about. It's a poster. I know, three metres by four metres. On all the billboards in New York. Alberta. Everywhere I went, Alberta. Ask Cleopatra. Not as herself, not even as Albertina, but Cleopatra. I'd just written a book about Telelamana, the 18th dynasty of ancient Egypt, and the life, the story of Moses and monotheism by Freud, etc. etc. Egypt was one of my was my secret agenda, which she soon unraveled, and we laughed about it. The thing was that she had become the symbol on the buildings of New York. Beautiful woman, powerful woman, Cleopatra, for Newsweek. The fascinating thing about Medium Cool is all the way through it, there is this question of attacking the press and the journalists and the people who are documenting it, actually exposing it incorrectly, however or whatever. At this moment in time in New York, if you were trying to document it, you were a pig. Actually, they didn't want you. When I got into Colombia, they said, no, God, we don't want anyone with a camera. Go away. 
And it was only by accident that one of the guys who was standing near there, who was part of the committee, had seen my films at the New York Film Festival. But I, I said, well, look, come on, I'm not, you know, I'm not television. I make independent films. I've just made a film about protest and Vietnam War and, 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 and this guy. And he said, hold on a minute. What? And he discovered, apparently, he'd seen my film. He went and talk, spoke to Tom Hayden and they said, OK, come on in. Yeah, great. Great to have you. Yeah. Hi, my name. And I was in there for a week. I was in there more than a week because I was in there during the second bus, too. So the whole question of the image, the photograph, the representation. I want to say now, Catherine, that my film is not about a love story at all. I might say that I would have to use and could use the family romance as part of it, but that's not necessarily a love story. It might be disguised as a love story, but hold on, you're halfway through, the love story ceases to be joy and love, and what does it become? Tragedy. Tragedy. Maybe my love story with Alberto is going to end up in tragedy. Maybe the story in... Um, in Medium cool. I can't remember having watched the end lately. But what I was about to say is, look, this article in Framework FR, Framework 52, Framework, Journal of something or another, Journal of Film and Media. The life and work of Peter Whitehead, 1,000 pages in full colour. Right now, the best article in the whole thing is by Jeremy Varon, as far as I'm concerned about my film, The Fall. He's a professor at New York University. I'm not quite sure why. He's written many, many, many books about the 60s. He's an expert on the 60s and on the question of radicalism and anarchy and goodness knows what else. I just, I'm not going to read it because it's about 30 pages. And he's, well, Catherine, if you haven't read it, I'll send you a photocopy. But what I'm interested in is, how did he describe the film, his article, at the top? Here it is. After the fall, politics, representation, and the permanence of empire in the cinema of Peter Whitehead. I could have told him, if you want to understand the fall, Jeremy, you have to understand two things. One, Goddard, and two, Alberta. But I didn't, because I never met him. He just watched the films and he wrote this. But if you read it closely, and I've had to read it several times to understand it, it's an academic work referring it to all kinds of things. He uses the word representation. Now, I just thought that was a useful kind of a word about identity and this and me putting myself in the film. But somebody recently told me, he said, you idiot, it was actually a whole kind of critical movement. Oh, apparently at this moment in time during the development of protest literature and art, and that the whole question was about representation. For me, the fall was influenced by Hare and Goddard which forced me in the end to accept defeat and decide that I could, I ought to, that it was my responsibility to put myself into the film. I could not stand back by shooting all this film, presenting it all, and then hiding myself. Because I am a person. Let's say there has to be a love story. At the but my love story was with New York. Um, part of New York was on all the buildings of Alberto Tiburzi and in my bed. And I was in love with her. And she was, she was reading throughout the whole of my making my film a book. It was called The Bolivian Diary of Che Guevara. Well, there were not many Italian fashion models of her ilk who were sitting reading a book called The Bolivian Diary, the diaries of Che Guevara that he wrote in Bolivia 
before the CIA found him and shot him dead. She was reading it. She'd often wake me up in the morning and say, listen, you remember you were talking about this last night? Look at this. We would discuss it. She'd help me with Pierre Le Fou and lots of other things. Well, now, the weird thing is that this book, in English, The Diaries of Che Guevara, I published. I had published before I ever met Alberta through my company, Lorama Publishing. I was the first person in the world to publish the Bolivian diary of Che Guevara in English, publishing it in my publishing company. She was reading up Che Guevara. So happens, it's quite ironic for me anyway, I laugh at things like this. I am known in France as the Che Guevara of the cinema. But let's overlook like that. I can't use this opportunity to sell myself anymore. Right. However, what happened then, of course, was Colombia. Colombia. Well, Colombia made my film and probably destroyed my relationship to Alberta because it was so total. It was the fruition, it was the culmination, it was the coming together, it was the, the representation level that me trying to deal with the notion of what can film be or art should be and, and how, can, how can it be expressed. Wexler was clever because he was using the couple to focus all the time the way we should read what was happening. They were the eyes, not the camera, or they were the camera plus the eye. I had, I wanted to show my film being cut, my life being cut by my film, myself being destroyed by what is happening in Vietnam and New York and whatever. I found just two or three days ago, looking through these diaries, something that almost made me weep. In Alberta's diary, she had written, I was very moved today. I, I can't find it, it's too complicated. I was very moved today watching Peter editing our film, some of the sequences that we had shot recently. In the editing room, because I'd moved up a movieola into the, whatever it was, somewhere or another, and I had a little, and I, okay. And she said, I was fascinated by it because I could see the way he took films and bits and this and that and the other and how he'd cut it up and chuck some out and put it up and this and he was how he was creating. She had that kind of a mind, you see. She wasn't going to just be saying, well, what do I look like? I like those images of me on a thing and with crosses on it and looking like Marilyn Monroe. Okay, she's a woman, she was allowed to do that a little bit, but she was interested in the process of the film. What was she doing? Why? Why was I doing that? Etc. Very, very, very intelligent girl. At the end of a little thing describing the scene of me chopping up the bits of film and making it into the, the film, she said, I only wished I'd had my camera there and I could have filmed it. <laughs> Ironic to say the least. <laughs> Just as I had often said, oh, I wish I'd had my camera there when I was in bed with Alberta, but let's not be, let's not be rude about it. Okay, so, and I told her, well, I said, you won't believe this, but I've, I've, I've just written that. Look, I've got it. I said, this is the whole thing. I'm shooting a film, but I have to show why and how. I have to show myself writing about it. I have to show you how the camera working in it, and this and that and the other. The thing is a product. The final film is a product of a kind of web. A spider's web, a no-zone web of connections and representation. What is the truth in the end if I've mixed up all these people, all the things that are said? Che Guevara, Alberta, Mayor Daly, goodness knows what else. How dare I say that it's, how dare I sort of, you know, put it all into a pot and put a little red cherry on the top and say, here you are, it's cooked. We don't cook cakes, do you? Um, 
I wanted it to be savage, actually. I wanted it to hurt. I wanted the film to hurt because I was hurt. I had been hurt. Alberta was hurt too, but not so much, of course, by that. She'd lived in New York for five years. Alberta was hurt by the fact that her picture was spread over all the walls in New York. You know. And as she put it, I don't want any more to use my body and my face and my beauty to sell things like Newsweek, to sell myself or sell toothpaste or whatever. I've come to the end of it. And she had. When we finished the fall, she stopped being a fashion model. She went to Rome and became a photographer and photographed other fashion models and became the editor, the picture editor of Vogue for now 20 years. She was too intelligent, too smart, too self-aware to go on being a model. I think in a funny way, though, that image up on the walls and me making this film and having a complete nervous breakdown in the middle of it, I might say, um, I did her in. That's a horrible expression. But it, no, it helped her, I believe, to make the decision she was already half making. Finally, she'd met a guy who wanted to make a film with her. Great, and we did a film. Maybe, you know, she often thought, well, gosh, I wonder how far this can go. Maybe I, somebody will offer me a part as an actress. But I think by the time I'd been in Colombia for two or three weeks, off and on, filming all that, the hair love story, the romance love story, which we could kind of cope with, and that she thought it was quite reasonable enough in a way that if I was filming everything in that particular moment, I had to lay my cards on the table. You know, if it was if I was filming me in New York and filming me, or New York was filming me, I had every right to put a love story, as Catherine has called it. But in the end, you see Alberta looking at the images where she's crossed out and everything, and she goes, oh. It's very interesting for me that par in parallel, the yin viewpoint that was represented by Alberta was her resentment at being seen as a beautiful woman and being photographed merely because she was a beautiful woman and she could sell soap or perfume or a beautiful dress. Fair enough, she'd been young at that time. She'd enjoyed the travel, the people, loved to see herself loved admired, respected, fine. But I tried to put into the film, not quite clearly enough, I don't think, perhaps, that her growing, her growing resentment about being used, the way that I was using the students, using Columbia to make a film which I, was mentally and, very, and emotionally very important to me. I was using the ciphers. She was one of the ciphers. She represented for me the ultimate female image. <laughs> what could be better than being her plastered all over New York? The last scene in the film with her, you asked about it, Catherine, is where she's watching and we're watching the image, and then suddenly she gets up and goes out. She's had enough. She just you know, she doesn't want to be seen. She's, she's given her pledge. She said yes, she could do this and everything. And then just wondering if I can find the last one. That's it, didn't I? The last one. The last. One, the last. One, the, last one, the very last time she ever. Can't find it. Benefit. Well, I'll tell you another story which is very funny. Lily Moore, Alberta. Can't find the final, the final letter. I'll send it to you that Alberta wrote in her diary of when we parted. Is it here? I can't. It's a little thing here, like it says benefit. 
Another little story before my film runs out, which is relevant in an odd kind of way. Two stories actually. One at the same time that I was in London at the time with Lily Moore, I was offered a part as an actor. <laughs> Believe it or not, in a feature film in Japan. Michael Caine had got the part and he was going to act there with Natalie Delon. Well, unfortunately he got ill and decided not to do it and the producers invited me, because they were the producers of Benefit of the Doubt, to do a screen test in Paris, because they thought I would be rather good as the person, because I was supposed to be an Englishman in Japan who falls in love with a French girl. So I was flown to America, down to the studios, did a screen test and got the part. Got the part. Fell in love with um, Natalie Delon, how could I not do? I lived with her for two years instead. Anyway, that's another story, isn't it? Okay, well, benefit of the doubt. It was a play, a film about a play. It had a play within the play and had all these other bits and pieces that I added of the players and the actors and the, who all went around. It's a bit sort of like this thing called uh, uh, they remain and I don't remain and they have gone and I, I can't remember the full title anymore. But a kind of interactive play about protesting the war in Vietnam with not a story, a series of you know, scenes actually without a plot. So when I finished the film, I had all this documentary film. I didn't know what to do, as they say. So what I did was I decided to interview all the actors and the actresses and Peter Brook, because they had helped to make it. They had actually written it. So it's a play, and it's my questioning of it. I was the Catherine Hamilton at that point, questioning the play. It went to New York for the film festival. Very successful. People liked it. Some people said they liked it more than the play. I'm in New York with Alberta one day and someone who's a friend of a friend who rings me up from London to say there's a lawyer here who wants to ring you, can he speak to you? And I said, yeah, of course. I get this lawyer on there and says, hi, I think we've met. And I said, oh, really? And I couldn't remember. He said, well, I'm Peter Brooks' lawyer. And I said, oh, fine, yeah, well, give it. He said, I'm here with Peter Brook in London. You're in New York, I hear, making a new firm. I said, yes, very exciting. He said, yeah, very exciting. And I said, well, um, yes, can I help? He said, well, yes, I'm afraid we have some very, very, very bad news. I said, well, what's that? He said, well, we've just discovered that your film, Benefit of the Doubt, showing next week, opening next week in London, in, sorry, in New York, in, and has been shown in the New York Film Festival. I said, yes, fantastic. Please tell, I hope Peter's pleased about it. I mean, what a su amazing, unexpected success. Silence. He said, I'm going to have a word with um, Peter Brook in a moment, but I just think I should tell you the technical problems that we have. And I said, well, yes, go ahead. He said, well, you don't own the film. I said, how do you mean? He said, you don't have the right to show it. I said, well, I made a film. Well, of course I have a right to show it. He said, well, not in the New York Film Festival and not without our permission. I said, I'm terribly sorry, old boy, but I have a contract with Peter Brook, and I have a contract with the writers, and I have a contract with the musicians, and I have a contract with the Royal Shakespeare Company. I do own the film. I have every right to do anything and everything I want to do with it. He said, well, are you sure? I said, yeah, do you want me to send you photocopies? He said, no, I better have a word with Peter Brook. Peter Brook comes on and says, hi, hello, Peter. I said, hi, Peter, isn't it great about the film showing in New York Film Festival? And he said, no. He said, I'm just about to make a feature film based on the play. I said, right. He said, they were going to give me $200,000 to make a feature film. And they opened the New York Times and there's a review of your film, which they just thought that they were going to finance. I decided to make a love story out of the story and to make a feature film with the documentary films about. I've taken one of the girls in the play and one of the boys and I've written the story. Now I've lost the finance. I want you to sign a contract saying you're not going to show the film anywhere else in the world and that you don't own it. And I said, I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> I'm terribly well, calm. 
Anyway, I ring up the girl, one of the girls in the... I said no. I rang up one of the girls in the um, play who, by chance, please forgive me for saying this, Catherine, but I, I say it to you and nobody else. I'd had an affair with a very pretty actress in the Royal Shakespeare Company. Yes. While I was making the film Benefit of the Doubt. We remained very good friends for years, off and on. And I rang her up and said, well, what's this about Peter Brook? What you, what's he going? She said, yes, isn't it good news? I thought, oh, this good news. I said, um, what's it? Yes, it's, well, they've written a script. It's really rather touching. It's about a girl, a young girl and, um, and a guy she's in love with and all that, a romance kind of a story. I said, yes, and they're using the ideas that were in the play. Uh, U.S. and the Royal Shakespeare and all this and everything, and um, it's going to be called Tell Me Lies. <laughs> Tell Me Lies. That was the name of a poem that was in the play. Tell Me Lies. And I said, wow, that's fantastic. Tell me more about it. Well, as we had been girlfriend, mom, boyfriend, boy meets girl, and boy doesn't necessarily always meet the right girl, but on this occasion it was the right. And so I said, well, tell me what it's like. She tells me the story, and I thought, Sounds a bit naff to me. It's not that easy, I said. <laughs> I knew by now. To combine documentary film with fiction. Sure, I quoted Freud, you know, the family romance, and all that kind of stuff. And she said, well, she said, I am playing the part of the girl. <laughs> I, remember th I remember thinking, Oh, well, here I am in New York. Here, there's my ex-girlfriend, another of my ex... Well, my ex-girlfriend, who was in Benefit of the Doubt, now going to be in a play by um, Peter Brook, which is based on the play that was in the Royal Shakespeare Company, and I was trying to make a film with Alberta, who was going to be the actor. But it was rather a nice coincidence, I thought, actually, that her name would resonate somehow or another if I ever saw the film. Well... I saw the film. It was the worst film I had ever seen in my life. And this is not me being bitchy, because for it, you'd never, it was a total failure. I think it was shown twice. And the people who put up the money had tried to strangle me. I was thrilled a bit that they lost the lot. It's not easy. <laughs>